start and go. Um, okay, so uh, so yesterday we mostly wrapped up the question in the Bali the Rushalmi. Uh, the last point on that page, um, if you notice at the end of Beit Yosef, was Beit Yosef that, um, suggested an interesting position, which was, do you remember, did, did any of you get the end of the Beit Yosef, his second half of it? Okay, so I'll pull that up just for for a second. But if you looked at the at the end of that that passage in the Beit Yosef, he has a fascinating suggestion that um, not only do you not um, do say zichron trua on uh, on Shabbos, but that you might say zichron trua at night, right? Because night is not the time of of tkiat shofar. Um, let me pull it up for a second. Ah, there you go. But it's don't be yom and trua though, because yom is very right. good. And I assume, and and that's I think exactly what what Gabi says. I think the reason I'm not in this way is because, um, right, the the assumption of that of that position is that you seize your control whenever you can't practically blow. The maskana, what we do is that no, it's about the type of day that it is. If a type of day when you blow the show first, even if now you can't practically blow the show first, it doesn't matter. Um, which which um, pushes us in the idea that we developed yesterday that the fact that we say zichon trua on Shabbat is not just a technicality; it reflects something fundamental about the day. Um, so look here, just the, the latter half there of uh, of the Beit Yosef, quoting Shimon Adeshen, the Katab Shimon Adeshen, generally sheish lo harvit kadish v'tila harvit zichon trua, the Shimon Adeshen who. Gavi, let's see if you remember what's special about Shumat Adeshen, who wrote the Shumat Adeshen, what's special about the Shumat Adeshen, all that stuff. Shumat Adeshen is Rabbi Yisrael Iserloin, he's 15th century, and he has the clean sweep of Shulchan Aruch, right? All 345 of his are quoted somewhere in Shulchan Aruch and Nusei Kalim. He's a very important posseg, and again, as I've said every single time, that's what I heard from Rav Shechter. I have no idea if it's true. I've never checked it. I'm sure Rav Shechter knows better than I do. I do not know the Truman Adeshin or Shulchan Aruch well enough to know you if that is is true. But um, but he's a very important posting. Um, so the Truman Adeshin, right? She really she is no more bekidush with the arvit zechon shua afil shechal yod chol. That even during week at night, since you don't blow the shofar, you say zechon shua. We should do laila loves man shua. But he notes of olam lo nagu kain. And the reason is exactly what Gabi said. But Tam, we should blow dummy le Shabbat. The difference is that it's not about can you practically blow shofar now, it's about whether the day is defined as Yom Trua. And a regular Rosh Hashanah where you're going to blow the next day, just as you don't blow at night, doesn't mean that the day is not a Yom Trua, it just means that now is not the time when you should show. Okay, that was just the last point I want to take on that. Now let's move to what I want to talk about today. So, um, the topic, as I said, that I want to talk about is, okay, let's say you do blow the shofar. Chazal say you're not supposed to. Now what? Okay. Now what? Did you fulfill a mitzvah? I mean, the question I'm really asking is, what is the rabbinic power to tell you, um, right? How much power do they have over mitzvah? Do, right. Now, the, the reason that they are allowed to tell you not to blow the shofar is part of a very far-reaching halachic and philosophical topic called Akirat Davar Minatara. The main sugya of it is in Yivamot, Daf Peitet, through Daf Tzadi. Um, but basically, Koach Nit Nebiyat Chachamim Lakor Davar Minatara. The rabbis have the power to uproot um, things in the Torah. The way the Bavli seems to conclude is Beshev Ve'al Ta'aseh, only passively, meaning they can tell you don't perform a mitzvah. They cannot tell you to violate an avira. The Yerushalmi seems not to pass in that way. The Yerushalmi seems to pass in the Koch Nit Nabiyat Chachamim Lakor Davar Min Atara Afilu B'Kum Vase that that uh, Chazal have the power to uproot the Torah even uh, actively. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Tosfot seems to fundamentally agree with the Yerushalmi against the Bavli and interprets the Bavli in a way that allows for for um, active uprooting of the Torah. Um, and then you have all types of interesting. Issues there, right? Philosophically, why are they allowed to do that? Practically, who's allowed to do that? Is it only the Sandrin? Is it any bait in, even a bait in of three? Is that crazy? Maybe it is. Do post can still use it nowadays? Short answer is yes. Um, everyone thinks no, but I can give you a tube of Ramosha Feinstein where he invokes it. I can give you a tube of Ruvan Yosef where he invokes it. I can give you a tube of Tridh where he invokes it. 
They don't invoke it by itself. They try to hedge, but uh, but they all do quote it as at least one of the possibilities in uh, in practical shuvot. So that's three 20th century poskim who invoke it at some point, um, in some way, shape, or form. What? In what context? Uh, the Sri to Asia, it's one of the law, arguments that he invokes in the context of his Koisha Chuva. Um, for Moshe, it's one of the arguments he invokes in terms of allowing people to take money for, for being uh, Rebbeim, Rabbaim, and Kalel, um, following Kesishna. And Ravadya uses it as one of his arguments in permitting people to marry Karaites. Um, okay, so, so the, the implications are fine are uh, far reaching and yes, when people tell me it's never used anymore, I pull out, I, I give a share of this once. I gave, you know, I was like, here, here's three 20th century to vote where people invoked it in some way, Lamaisa, not as the only logic, but but it's not, clearly not off limits uh, entirely, but fascinating for another time. Um, we can marry carriage. Yes, I have a cousin who's married to a carriage. Um Yes. Um, you know, meaning he's a Chiloni Karite, she's a Chiloni non karite I don't really, you know, they're both you know, like Chiloni Israelis. How practically different that looks, I don't know. But the rabbi, of course, the rabbi, they are allowed to marry because it was the Ptah of Ravada, and uh, and um, they are Svarti. So I don't know if the rabbi distinguishes, but if they do distinguish and follow Ravada only for Svartim and they can still marry, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I I really didn't know that they were like Karites around practically, but then. Like my wife's cousin married a carry. So there you go. Now now I know they exist. Um so uh yeah. Okay. So let us go to this topic. So th- that's the background we're not gonna get into. But assuming that background, now the rabbis tell you don't do it. So do you fulfill the mitzvah? Okay? So uh first things first. If we interpret the sugya the way we basically teased out from Yehonatan yesterday, which is that if you want to synthesize the Bavli and the Yerushalmi, you can do that by saying there is no mitzvah according to the Bavli or the Yerushalmi, only Yerushud, right? There's no mitzvah in anybody. It's just optional. Um, and then the question is, once it's optional, the rabbis say don't do it. So that really would lower the stakes here. You'd say, look, the Bavli doesn't think there's a mitzvah that Hazal told you not to do. They think there's a Rashut that Hazal told you not to do. It's just optional. So then this is not really... Such a big, you know, it's not such a big issue. Okay. I mean, what does that mean? Did I or did I not fulfill an optional mitzvah? I don't know. Right? The real question is the simple understanding how most people understand the Bible, which is that if you ask God and say, should I blow the shofar on Shabbat? He would say, yes, blow the shofar on Shabbat. Right? Next, next Shabbat, as crazy as that is. Right? I know you've been in quarantine and probably feeling the feeling of time. Is not normal, but yes, a week from this Shabbat, amazingly, is um, yes, isn't that wild? No, I know. Yes, Lichot is this month's Shabbat already. Yes, it's crazy. It's crazy. I have like time, yes, look, time in quarantine, or even in the Katsi quarantine we had, you know, in after Purim, which was you know, six months ago already, time is like, you know. If it weren't for like Shir Shalyam, I don't know if I would know what day it is, right? I have to like remind myself in the morning. It's, um, yeah. But yes, we start Slichot and Matzai Shabbat, and uh, Rosh Hashanah is only a week from this coming Shabbat. Yes, wild. Wild as that is. Um, so, so God would tell you, blow the shofar. The rabbis come and say, look, we want to protect Shabbat. We don't want you to carry our Bama Birsud Arabim. So you can't blow the shofar at all. Because, you know, you might be in whatever lockdown they're planning for Rosh Hashanah and you're not so good at blowing the shofar, so you'll walk from uh, from 39 to uh, to um, the 35 to uh, to learn how to blow a shofar. And we don't want you to do that, so we tell you don't blow the shofar at all. On the second day, you can do that because you're allowed to carry a note. Okay? Fine. You decide you're going to blow the shofar. Now what? I mean, not you. Someone who doesn't care about Chazal. Okay, none of you. God forbid. Somebody else, somebody else who uh, is questionable of the entire rabbinic establishment. So he doesn't want to see. I, I don't buy this old Russia thing. I don't buy these zeros. Or someone really, really believes that there is no Shud Harabim nowadays. So he just doesn't understand why the Takana should exist. Right? He's he's totally convinced by these uh, all those fascinating reads of 
all of Mechel Erevin and Shabbat, which may or may not be recorded in Shulchan Aruch, but whatever. Whatever the case may be, besides to blow the shofar on Shabbat, now what? So what are the possibilities, right? Now what? Right, what are the logical possibilities? How do we look at him in heaven, right? Right, so one possibility is he did a mitzvah, he also violated a rabbinic command, and up, you know, when he gets to Shemaim, God will have to square those together. You have a check for shofar and X for violating what the rabbi said, and, uh, you know, somehow he'll have to, to, to come up with a cheshman for you. Okay? Um, right. I, I, I'm just wondering, how would we go apply some of Bob, 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 Bob era? So, so, right, so formally, it's probably not the full mitzvah Baba Vera because it's a rabbinic, right, violation, right? It's, uh, but it might be something like that. Um, but you could basically take what Rami is saying and take it to the extreme, which is, no, right? Once the rabbis say don't do it, so it's wrong to do it. And God himself concedes the point, and now you blow the show for the rabbis have successfully removed the schar. I don't know how they do that, but they do it, right? They remove it. You didn't fulfill the mitzvah. That's it. Um, and that is the million dollar question here. Um, and as you know, I noted, this is not the only case when you have to ask that, right? You have to ask it here. You have to ask it by shofar, but you have to ask it really in a lot of places, like, you know, the examples we'll look at, saying, get my after chato, like sitting in a sukkah, in a way which is permitted me to write up forbidden me the Rabbanan, right? Those are the two examples that we're really going to look at. I mean, as we'll see. Sorry, so you're sitting in the sukkah when it's raining. Uh, so that's different because there you right sitting in the sukkah when it's raining, as Chazal understand it, you're you're exempt biblically, right? Not rabbinically, you're biblically exempt because it's tire pot from an asukah, right? So there, okay. right. So there, right, and the Yerushalmi is quite harsh in that particular one, right? Yerushalmi there says um, that right? anyone who's exempt from something and does it anyways, what's hedyev? Uh, normal. So, right, so in, 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 right, we usually use like regular, but, but technically, where's the word come from? Right, it it's very it means the same thing often that the English equivalent means. Idiot. Idiot. Thank you. Had you an idiot are the same word. Yes. Right. That's what it means. He's an idiot. Um. Yes, they are etymologically related. Um. So we we we're very not happy with such a person who uh who um so who eats in a sukkah while it's raining, really raining. Um. But that's different, right? There he's fundamentally exempt. Here. We assume that please, he's obligated, right? according to the, to the Bavli, the simple shot of the Bavli. So what, is, what happens? Now, logically, each of them has an advantage and has a disadvantage. What's the advantage of saying that he doesn't fulfill a mitzvah? Or does? Pick one. Right? Which one is more intuitive to you? There's no right or wrong answer. What's intuitive to you? I mean, Meaning, which would you think, right? Which you think is right? Why? And, and justify it, right? Do you think it makes more sense that when the rabbis tell you, don't do it, and you do it anyways, that you fulfill a mitzvah all right, uh, you just violate a mitzvah the rabbi, you know, an avera the rabbanan, or that somehow the rabbis make it that you didn't fulfill the mitzvah at all? Which is more intuitive to you, right? Which would make sense to you? Rami has already staked out a position, right? Rami thinks it makes more sense that you don't fulfill the mitzvah because there's some sort of a mitzvah of Abba right here, right? And you shouldn't have done it. So to say that you get reward for doing that which you should not have done, that seems very unlikely, right? That was the position that Rami staked at. I would take the other side that Good, why? Um, you do, you do, you know, fulfill the, the right to obligation, whatever it is. But on top of that, you also get this uh, rabbinic um, Avera. Good. What, so what, what drives you to that position, right? Why is that intuitive to you? Because the Rabbanon, the rabbis can't just outright negate a jail, right? So right. So the, right, the logic to saying what Yonatan says is where the rabbis get, it's one thing to say the rabbis are allowed to tell you to not do a mitzvah. Because that's telling you in practice what to do and what not to do. 
to say that some of you don't get tsar implies that they have some control over the metaphysical fabric of the universe, which is surprising, right? Good. So, Rummy, you want to respond? Well, we'll let you find it out. So, uh, the thing is that there are um, these rabbinic, uh, like, rabbinic authority isn't just coming out of uh, the, the nowhere. It's, uh, it, it, it's sort of derived from the power, and so therefore, uh, like, they, they have the authority to make these, uh, like, those question that you shouldn't do that. So, I don't know, like, for God to have, like, this secret reward if you, like, break, uh, Good, right, right. So Rami is making what I think is a is a is a pretty good argument, which is look, rabbinic power is grounded in the Torah, and I think more than that, right? Rami's last point is, well, what would that even make? Right? How does that make sense? If you fulfill the mitzvah, you're violating the rabbanan. Meaning, what does that mean? Meaning, the rights are stronger than the rabbanan. So now, you violated the rabbis and you blew so far, and you're going to tell me that in Shemayim, I'm going to check on the right on an X on the rabbanan. It makes no sense. What are the rabbis doing? Why should I ever listen to the rabbis when they tell me not to do a mitzvah? Right? Meaning, if there's any meaning to their takana, it must be that when they say something, it reflects what I'm supposed to do. Right? Because their power is grounded in the Torah. And I don't know how it works. So I think you could divide. Right? One way is to come up with a strong thesis and say that the rabbis actually have a power to change the metaphysical reality of the world. And therefore, you don't fulfill the mitzvah. An alternate way, which I think is more what Rami is actually saying, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Rami, is no. It's not that they're changing the fabric of reality. It's that God wants you to listen to the rabbis. If you don't, it's not, they don't have to do anything. right? They're not uprooting the mitzvah. It's that now that you're supposed to listen to the rabbis, you're not supposed to be doing the mitzvah. And God isn't going to be happy with you because you did a mitzvah because he wants you to listen to the rabbis. Now, you could come up with middle positions like, yeah, technically you fulfilled the mitzvah, but it's not what God wanted. So that's, we don't call that a mitzvah or something more amorphous like that. Yeah, yeah, Go push back. I think there's another uh, two and a half position again here where uh, it depends somewhat on your intent. Um, if you intended to, you know, violate a derivana and do this, you know, derivata, you know, because it's a derivana, but there's still a derivata. Like if you have in mind that there is a derivana, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are against this, but you still did it anyways. That might count against you. But if you don't have it at all, this Derabon Xera, and you do the Derabon anyways, then that might only count from Zera, right? It right. So, so, uh, right. So, what, what you're putting on, I think, is pulling out is that the two formulations I gave of Rami's, right, position are really two different positions, right? To say that, that the rabbis have the power to change the metaphysical reality. So then it doesn't matter. Amazing, let's put it that way, right? Meaning, if someone just forgot it was Shabbos because we're in quarantine for weeks and, like, no, he doesn't remember what day of the week it is. He knows it's Rosh Hashanah, but he forgot it's Shabbos, so he blows the shofar. So if the rabbi, the reason you don't fulfill the message is you think the rabbis have control over the reality of the world, so even though it was an accidental thing, he didn't mean to go against the rabbis, he wouldn't fulfill the message of shofar. But if you think, no, the rabbis don't have the power to change reality, it's just that you are a rebel against the rabbi. So God is going to not want your mitzvah. So then if you rebel against the rabbis, you say, I don't re believe in the rabbinic establishment. I'm going to blow the show for anyways. So God isn't happy with you. You don't fulfill the mitzvah. But if, but Tumas Libcha, right? You forgot what day it is, right? You haven't seen the light of day in 14 days, right? right? In 14 days, you forgot it was Shabbos. So you, right, you blew the show for, so then, right, through the back door, you fulfilled the mitzvah del Raisa. Because you forgot, you weren't going against the rabbis, you forgot about it. Right, but you knew it was right, so you blew the shofar. Right, that would be the difference between saying that the reason you don't fulfill the mitzvah is because rabbis change the metaphysical reality and saying, no, it's just that we're, we're a rebel. It's mitzvah bavavira, there's all this negativity wrapped up in it, so that, that is what discounts mitzvah. Right, not that the rabbis somehow remove the reward, that God doesn't want you to be going against the rabbis, and therefore it poisons the whole, whole seat. Right, and that would be, so that would be, exactly, so that would be two, or three possibilities, right? Two and a half, whatever we can call it, right? If we if we put it here in the chat, right? one, right? you don't get reward, right? Because one A, right? The rabbis remove the metaphysical 
reward, right? One B, once you rebel against the rabbis, it becomes some sort of mitzvah above Avera or two, right? You do fulfill. Right, you do get whatever you do get biblical reward. Okay. Yeah, Jonathan, go. I have another uh, argument in support of the first thing you said, or the, the thing I think I said. Of you get both a reward and a favor. Um, it could be. I mean, you said I think one of the responses was that why would be why would you ever follow the Xerah or Ben if you still get the reward? Go ahead. So it could just be. Yeah. The Avera, so to say, is worse than whatever scar you're going to get from the mitzvah. Right, and that's what you'd have to answer. You'd have to say that, right? You have to say. You know, it's 100% right. You have to say, yes, one is biblical, one's rabbinic. But the fact that God wants you to listen to the rabbis means that in the end of the day, you're never going to come out positive on this, right? Because what you did is always systematically wrong, right? It goes against the right what God wants, right? And I think the answer is going to be somewhat is that if we think in a little bit less formal terms, right, either, right, you could subdivide either to say something like, right, um, right, the sin of violating a rabbinic demand is worse than the reward or whatever is greater than the reward of fulfilling an say, which is a little bit of a weird formulation. But the more likely formulation is that we need to look at the big picture, right? It's just, right, big picture, right? Which is, you know, you know, right? God, you know, God wants you to keep the system, so, right? He will ensure you don't, you don't come out on top for violating. Right, something like that. Right now, again, as I said, I didn't want to get too much into these um, b bizarre um, positions like um, right, the Arachayim, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll show it to you. One second. FK. Uh, See. Yeah, yeah, right. So you come up with a very strong formulation that they really do have the power to change the metaphysical reality, and that you would get from a wild position like this one, right? And this is this is is an orachayim. The orachayim is commenting on Moshe says to God, "I'll tafe an ilmen chatan." Right, the people in Korach. Carbono, no, right, right, right. Don't, don't, don't listen to their carbono. So the Arachayim sets for us this thesis: the da. Yeah. Sadiq power to remove the reward that evil people have when they see that these evil people are in fact totally evil. Vuhu sod Sadiq Moshel Yirat Elokim. Perush Moshel Birat Hashem. This is what it means in Shmuel Bet that the tzaddik actually controls the fear of God, meaning he controls the fear of God. That they want to remove the reward. What God Himself wouldn't do. Just like in this world, the rabbi had the power to take away the property of sin. So by the same power, they have the they are able to take away your reward. Right? You can come up with these diseases. Right? That is a very well thesis, but you could justify um one one A, right? One A that they actually remove the metaphysical reward with some sort of thesis. Um, like that. But let's look at what the uh, 
the Mepharshim actually say on this. So let's turn to the sources now that we've we've outlined the theoretical possibilities, okay? So the first source we turn to, the first example where we'll test this, is the Mishnah in Brachot, right? The first Mishnah in Shas, which I hope at some point all of you have seen, right? In one way or another. So who wants to take the first Mishnah in Shas? Right? This is not so tricky. I'm not read yet. Who has not read? Adam, you haven't read yet. I see you're with me. Okay, your turn then. Anybody? First Mishnah and Shas. Name of Sycorina Shema Davis. When do we recite Shema at night? Shash and Hakonim, if I see my bullet, we see my son. In the time when the Quran and the word I entered to their children, I'd so, Hashemira, Hashemira, then the first watch. Steeper Rabbi Eliezer, this is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. Until dawn. There was a incident where his son came to him from a party. And they said to him, No, Kalina was Shema. He didn't say Shema. He didn't read anything. He said to them, in the Lava, I'm with Hashachar, if the sun didn't rise you, you're obligated to read it. And then there's a bit of uh, and it's not only with this, 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 and it's not with anything that the Fakhamim said, if you have until Fakhamim, you really have until Amr Hashachar. That's it. Victor, Father Vime, they read, uh, it's Masan, uh, Chayyar, and the Shafar. So, the burning of the, for the burning of the rooms and effects, this is the left of the rooms and effects of the base of the uh, they had until Amr Hashafar to burn them according to the Bible, according to the Talmud and the Tos. Uh, Mikhail Hanah Khalim, and William Mazar, and, uh, everything that needed to be eaten within the, within one day. It's Masane, Ajiyala, and Hashachar, and it's was in Zil, Hashachar. In Cain, if this is so, Amar Amar Tachami, Matfatos, and Rich, the Tachamim is saying, Tachatos. Kidele ha 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 Good. Right. So the first example that we have is, right, as the Mishnah tells us, from a biblical perspective, are you allowed to reach Shema until dawn? Right, right, or dawn? Yes. But in order to prevent you from going home, relaxing, watching a few movies, and, and never getting around to saying, the line is, 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 is cut out, right? Because otherwise, they're afraid that you'll just be, right? You'll keep going. You're saying, I'm, I'm binge watching whatever until morning. I'll say Shema at some point, right? And then you, you know, you're on your, I don't know how many episodes you can binge watch in a night. I've never done it, but whatever. Right? As you're finishing, you, the sun is already peeking through. You're like, shoot, I, I missed Kriyat Shema. Right? Right? We don't want you to do that. So we tell you to do it by Chatzot. So you at least take a, uh, a Kriyat Shema break before, um, before midnight because you have a deadline. But what happens if somebody says Shema after or plans to say Shema after? Right? So now what? Right? So now what? Yes, Yonatan. Um, I was just going to question, uh, if the, so the Mishnah says that, uh, a mitzvah, that when the Chumim say, um, so really a mitzvah can be performed until dawn, but they're just doing it as a saver, right? Yeah. <laughs> My question is, you know, how can, you know, we say that? I mean, if the Chumim are decreeing until so how can we then extend it unless they say themselves. Good. So, it's, right. so this is going to be part of the question is what do they mean? And how can you say that? And, and what does it make, right? Meaning, Yonadan's point is, what do you mean? You can't say it past. You can say it past. So, 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 what, do you right? what does this even mean? Right? That, that's exactly what's going to push people, right? It's going to push some of the Farshim to say, no, you can't do that. And we'll see that in a minute. But you see what the question is here, right? What pushes you in favor of saying you could still say it after so is, well, biblically you're allowed to, so you should fulfill the mitzvah. What pushes you against it is, if that's true, then what are the rabbis doing? What did they accomplish? Right? right? If there's no real limit, because you could just say it afterwards and you'll still get the scar, so 
what it was, it was just advice it was a lie like what was it right that's the tension that you that's the interpretive question that you need to deal with okay let's look at one more example and then because these are the ones that the Rishonim are going to be playing off of um and then we'll uh, and then we'll look at the two two sides the other example that the Rishonim pick up this Mishnah in the second paragraph of Sukh, of Sukkah. So who wants to take the Mishnah? Adam can continue or someone else can volunteer to relieve Adam? Ah, oh, Adam can continue. Good. Okay, go ahead. Mishnah shows the above the Sukkah. One who has his head and look and most of himself in the Sukkah. Uh, Vishwakano, uh, Vishwakano, Vice and his, it is within. And his table is within his house. Beis Shammai, Posulin, Beis Shammai, you can't get to this. Beis Shammai, Machshimin, and Beis Shammai, Amr Laham, Beis Shammai, and the Beis Shammai. Alright, so Beis Shammai says, Amr Laham, Locha, Hayam, Ase, uh, and what there are an incident to Shahada, Kuzikne, Beis Shammai, Kuzikne, Beis Shammai, where the elders of Beis Shammai and the elders of Beis Shammai, uh, were walking to the as Rabbi Yochanan ben Hafala ben Hafalani to, um, to the house of um, of Rabbi Yochanan, the son of of the Chokhmah. Um, Uhu she haya shev roshav v'yom v'sukah and out exactly this where uh, he was sitting with his head and most of his body in the sukkah. Bishul Kano Yisroch Abayis and and his table was in his house. And they didn't say anything about it. They didn't challenge it. Yes. That's a rhetorical question, right? Is that proof? Is that true? Right. In that story, what happened? What did they say to him? They said to him, If this is your custom, no kiyantu. Okay, good. Never fulfilled my good. Good. So here's the here's, here's the question, right? The Mishnah tells us that there's a machloke. Hillel says, how much of you you needs to fit in your sukkah? If you fit in your sukkah, you're great. The tables and so no problem, right? You'll have your table outside the sukkah. You'll be in the sukkah and uh, you'll eat on your on your lap, right? You'll pull the food in as you're ready to eat and you'll eat it right inside your your mini sukkah. Beishamai says you can't do it. Right, you need to have your your table in the sukkah as well. Okay, that's the the machloket. What interests me is one, it, or what interests me shown to me here is one weird line, which is that Beit Shammai said that they once said to someone who followed Beit position. Right, what did they say? They saw him eating with his table outside. Lo kiyamta mitzvah sukkah miyamecha. If this is what you're doing, you never fulfilled mitzvah sukkah. Now, what's the problem with that language? It seems like the rabbinic uh, Xera is overriding the right. right time. Right, the problem is only rabbinic. And therefore, this language is suggested. So on the one hand, it might tell us the strong read, which is, oh, Loki Amta Mitzvah Sukkah. The rabbis somehow made it that you don't fulfill the mitzvah at all. You get no reward. What's the softer read? How would you push back on that read? But how would you say, read that line? And say, no, you do fulfill the mitzvah. You just violate, you shouldn't do it because the rabbis didn't say it. How would you have to read the words? How would you have to read the words? You never fulfilled sukkah. Yeah, Adam. You never fulfilled it. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, you just say you never fulfilled it properly with all the rabbinic strictures. Meaning, not that you didn't fulfill it. You did. Yeah, sure, it was a sukkah. Right? And that's the two ways that it's going to divide. Okay, good. So now let's look at the Rishonim. So which one do you want to look at first? Kriyat Shema or Sukkah? I, I put it in this direction. I don't really know why. It doesn't really matter. Right? Vinyona is a little bit more forthcoming than Tosh. But, but um, which do you want to start with? Doesn't matter to me. How about whoever volunteers to read can choose which one they want to read? Oh, come on. Yes, I know. We've mentioned it. Now, now we've moved to harder reading. Okay. I still can continue. You, 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 are, you, are, you, are, you are you are you are you are brave today. Okay, good. So what do you want? You want Tosfa or do you want Rabbeinu Yonah? Uh, 
Let's go with Toast Swiss. Okay. Take it away. This is Toast Swiss and Gidav Gimel. Okay. Uh, uh, you need to say that it's needed, that it's necessary, right? To include this, to base Hillel, nothing. That base Hillel are strictly to the bun. Uh, but, 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 this is an important word to know. This is mitalalta means sukkah in Aramaic, right? So with uh, sitting in an open sukkah, the gizay shema that they decreed their shema imashech hachashol chano, right? They decreed because they were worried you might be led after your table. Meaning, right? Once you're sitting, right. your table is out the, out of the sukkah. You'll be right going to the other side of the table to get food, right? right. Etc. Uh, the comrade, uh, the comrade, though, uh, Kiyamta Mitzvah and Sukkah and the, uh, Miyamasa. And they, that's what, and they, therefore they said that you haven't fulfilled the Mitzvah of Sukkah in your days. Let me do a even the Raisa, uh, though Kiyam, uh, you haven't fulfilled it. Let me do a Shamai, Nishma, and Beshira. Right, and from we learn from Shamai, the same will be true of Behil in parallel cases. Right, so simple shot in Tosvo, simple shot. Some people argue on this. Rosh Weiss doesn't like this. Rosh Weiss doesn't like this whole idea, so he tries to reread Tosvo. But simple pshat and Tosvo is, right, which one? Right? Like Rami, that you don't fulfill the mitzvah del right, uh, or like Yonatan, that you do? You don't, right? He's pretty clear, meaning he, you really have to, like, you really have to, like, counter-read him to say he's not saying what he's saying. Right? He says. You don't fulfill it biblically. He says it twice in like three lines. That's it. The rabbis say somehow get rid of it. I don't know if it's because they change metaphysical reality. I don't know because because, because God isn't happy with you because you're not supposed to be doing it, so he gets rid of it. I don't know if it's mitzvah above it. It doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you why. But Tosu is pretty clear in simple pshat that when the rabbis say don't do something, if you do it anyways, even technically on a biblical level, you should fulfill the mitzvah. Once the rabbis say no, that's it. You don't fulfill it, right? Attack it, defend it however you want, right? We've gone through all the theoretical possibilities. Tozer, again, Tozer's not very forthcoming here in terms of explaining how it works, why it works. He doesn't tell you, but he's pretty clear, I think, in terms of what he says. Okay, that's Tosvo. That's Tosvo. Um, you know what, before... You know, before we look at Rabbeinu Yonah, let's look at the opposite extreme, okay? Before we look at Tosva, look at the Ron, right? Rabbeinu Yonah is, a, is, is probably the lengthiest treatment that I know of in Rishonim. But the Ron is pretty short, and he's on the opposite side. Who wants to take up the Ron? Let's give Adam a break. Who wants to take up the Ron? I, I could do it. Okay, take it away. I don't, I don't get okay. So, uh, the call me shallow on the uh, slow shot development. Whoever doesn't say these three things, um, the pass off, what you see there. Right, so this one I assume I didn't need, I assume I didn't need to give you the background to this. You've heard of this phrase you need to know about, right? It's Robin Gamliel's famous, famous statement, which is if you don't say pass off my tomorrow, right, you don't fulfill your obligation. I hope to God you remember that line from the, you know, considering as Robin Gamliel says, that's what you need to do. And say at the Haggad, you know, theater, theater, to fulfill your mitzvah. I hope that you remember that one line because it is the most important part. So good. So on that line, so he wants to know. Presumably, those are in additions, right? To particularly fulfill the mitzvah in that way. Good. So what does he say? Kama uh, mean to say lo yade yo lo yase de kolato. He didn't pull his creation kolai properly. Lo yade de kolato kolal. Uh, lo, lo I'm saying you didn't fulfill it at all. Right. Utikavate. And he says, similarly, what other case to say, say this about? Uh, Utikavate basuka. The same thing is by a sukkah. Uh, but when you're in your sukkah. Right. Quote. Uh, in, right. Now he's, it's a quote, the line we just saw in the Mishnah. 
Im kein ayita noe. Yam 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 temitzvah to from yamecha. Right? This is the same theory of how you have to read that wine in sukkah, namely, right? By the way, this is the this is the best way, right? I you know I want you during the year to learn how to be careful readers. The problem is sometimes, as as you've seen that we shown him, the run solution to what sounds like an explicit Mishnah is Lavdafka. Yeah, don't take it too seriously. Okay, there's nothing I can do about that, right? Meaning there's nothing I can there's nothing I can do about that, right? The Ron's answer to what sounds like an explicit Mishnah is. Don't read it too carefully. It's an expression. It's hyperbole. What do you want from my life? Right? Okay. It's true. The rabbis use hyperbole. Okay. It happens. Right? The Rivash has a whole chuva about it in Shuvah Kofi and Aleph. Um, they do it. Right? They do it. But of course, that creates a metamorphosis, which is whenever they do that, are they serious? Right? When they, when they make these wild comparisons, does that mean you have to take them seriously? That itself is a machlokit is a machlokit rishav machron. So you can never win, right? Because some people say, oh, it's hyperbolic. No, 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 there's no such thing as hyperbole. If it sounds that way, it's true, right? The, the Taz notes at the beginning of Sven Reish, Reish Membet, I think, right? That it's a machlok at the tour and the, I don't know, it's also the Tours Pnei Yoshua. It's a general machlok. But anyways, yeah. So the Ron's solution to the whole thing is love Dafka, right? Whatever. Yeah, continue. Um, the the hello time is not the lo havi time is not the reason that the hahi elamishum the at the limshuche batok shokano. But it's the reason that maybe he'll come to um to sit in it, uh, by his table inside the house. I think saying right, right. I mean that's the reason by sukkah. Yeah. Vecholhe all this the lo imsha that is not. Ron makes the following argument. Right, he makes a very specific argument. He says, look. Why aren't you allowed to eat in a sukkah when your table is outside? Dilma ati lim shuche, because you might end up outside the sukkah. But he says, what happens if you violate the rabbinic law, you eat the sukkah, and we call hecha de lo imshech. But in any case in which you didn't end up outside the sukkah, you are an expert at eating with your foot on your lap. You didn't need to go out of the sukkah, right? You are, you are a professional rude eater. Right? You are fully happy to reach over the whole table and pull the food to you. Right? You never get up. You never ask. You never ask anyone to pass you food. You are happy to pull it over and shove it in your face. Right? So you stayed in the sukkah. No problem. How can you tell me that you didn't fulfill your obligation? This is the sukkah. It must be fulfilled the mitzvah. Right? So. Toshvot, I think, is pretty clear. He's taking out one of the formulations he suggested for Rami. And the Ron, pretty clearly, is taking out one of the formulations that we suggested for Yonatan, right? I'm not sure which one. He's a little bit more forthcoming than Toshvot. Right? He's a little bit more forthcoming. I, I still don't know exactly which one he wants, right? Meaning, you could still read it in different ways. But, yeah, Yonatan has an op opinion. What, does he think, what, what do you think the Ron means? It would seem to me that he's of the opinion that um, it depends on your intent. I mean, if you're doing this as, you know, a rebellion against the rabbis, then obviously it's not something you do. But if you're just doing this because, you know, you don't have in mind. So it could be. It could be. It could be, right? It's not clear that intent would make a difference. But you're right. It's possible to think, look, I know myself, if I do it, so I shouldn't have done it. But I wasn't doing it to rebel. Maybe I was doing it because I thought realistically I could eat while staying in the sukkah. Okay, I shouldn't have done it. But you're going to tell me I didn't fulfill? It could be that that's something like what the Ron is thinking, right? And maybe the Ron would maybe the Ron would say differently if you know you you'd said I want to stick it to the rabbis, right? I'm going to you know I could make a bigger sukkah, but I'm going to make it small, right? Yeah, you know, I don't know, right? Maybe he would do that. I I, I don't know. He's not that forthcoming in that sense. He doesn't detail it, but he, he but we, we seem to have as a machloke at Tosvot and the Ron. The Tosvot thinks that if you fulfill a mitzvah da right that the rabbis told you not to, somehow, biblically, you don't fulfill a mitzvah. And the Ron says, no, that's not the way life works. The rabbis told you not to do it. You shouldn't have done it. But if you did do it, okay, you still fulfill the mitzvah. 
Now, not so many people make the exact distinctions that Yonah does, but as we'll see, some of the Achronim suggest that it might depend, right, that not all rabbinic commandments or rules are created equal, right? It's possible that it will depend on the type of rabbinic command, right? So far, we've seen Toast vote makes a general statement. The Ron makes a general statement. Neither of them clarify if this would be true in every single rabbinic case. We don't know that yet, right? We don't know, and 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 it, it's that which leads some of the the other Ronim trying to come up with more sophisticated, nuanced middle positions. They always say yes or always no. Okay. Did you guys get a chance to read Ben Yona? Did anyone actually? Yeah. Okay. So let's let's oh, try to. Let's Okay, so let's try to get through Rabbeinu Yona, and maybe tomorrow we'll either you can decide you want to try longish achronim, right? Or we can start start by reading the achronim inside, and you can start on the next source sheet. We can figure it out however you want, right? The Kavod Kushyata is not short. it's not a hard Hebrew, but I didn't give it to you because it's not short, and I didn't want you to spend your whole time reading it. But it's 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 the reading reading wise, it's pretty easy. Okay, so let's look at Rabbeinu Yona. So Rabbi Yonah now going back to the Kriyatshma case. And he says, We now have to ask on the rabbis. Now we got to ask. Okay. The rabbis say, don't say Shema Pesach Chatzot. But what if you did? So now he says, if what the rabbis want you to do is, look, now it's two in the morning. It's past Chatzot. You shouldn't have done it. Now you're at two. You, 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 do, 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 right? R- Rabbi Yon is going farther. He's asking a proactive question, right? Now, not to, if you say, say Kriyat Shema, will you fulfill the mitzvah? But should you say Kriyat Shema, it's two in the morning. So he says, if you'll say read, not to read it, Kasha. How could the rabbis tell you not to say Shema? You're allowed to say Shema now, and it's a biblical mitzvah. They're going to tell you not to do the mitzvah. That makes no sense. So some people have a compromise. The rabbis can tell you after chatzot, don't say the brachot at all. Why? Rabbinic. So the rabbis have the power over their own rules. The rabbis have total control over their own laws. But Kriyat Shema, you should say. So if I stop there for Rabbeinu Yonah. Rabbeinu Yonah thinks like Yehonatan, but why? Right? Why does he think that? Because there's two, two separate things. One tries uh, about the, the brachot and one der, 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 Well, so, so that's why he thinks about... Right, but why does he think that not only do you get reward for saying Shema, but that you actively should say Shema, right? What's his logic? What's driving him to stake out that position? What does he say? Right, he is conceptually clear. He says, what's the reason? Because... The rabbis, the rabbis don't have a power to change. Yeah, the... <laughs> right? He says it's a power thing, right? This is a power question. It's an authority question. The rabbis have absolute authority over the Hinnic law. So if they say you have a mitzvah to say brachot, they can also say, and that mitzvah expires at chatzot. And after that, to say it is meaningless. But he doesn't believe rabbis have the authority to tell you really to not fulfill mitzvah to write them. Right. Yes, Yonah. Uh, if not, I mean, though, in the Mishnah, we're referring to uh, not Kriyat Shema, but just the brachot of Shema. As Rabbi Yonu, Yonu seems to be saying here, wouldn't the idea that, that um, when the Chachamim say Arkad so it really extends till dawn still apply despite that? So wouldn't the Prokot also then extend till dawn? Well, not necessarily, right? Because he could be saying that that's exactly what the Rabbi did. Is they said the rabbinic accoutrements to the mitzvah at Chatzot, we're not going to let you do anymore in order to motivate you to be able to fulfill the whole mitzvah in the right time. After that, we don't have the authority to tell you Shishma, but we're going to make it a less fulfilling experience to remind you that you shouldn't be doing that. Right? Something, right, something like that is what Rabbi Yonah is going to want. 
It just seems difficult to me to extrapolate that from the singular uh, language of the Hachamim in the Mishnah. Yes, and Rabbeinu Yonah, like I said, Toshvot takes out, stakes one position out. It's another, another position. Rabbeinu Yonah is the one who has a conversation. Right? Rabbeinu Yonah is saying, here's one possibility, right? But then as we'll see, and maybe we should, if, if, I think if we do it now, I think if we continue Rabbeinu Yonah now, we won't get it. So let's do, let's continue with Rabbeinu Yonah tomorrow and we'll try to think it up. But Rabbeinu Yonah is going, right? He's trying to, right? First of all, he's asking a more ambitious question, right? Which is not just post facto. If you did it, will you fulfill the mitzvah? But when the rabbis tell you to do something, are they really telling you, don't do it, even if that means giving up on a mitzvah, right? Are they telling you you shouldn't, right? He's asking the proactive, the right, say the ab initio question, but it's not really true because the whole case is bidyevet, right? I mean, this is not lechila. This is like lechila in a situation, right? So it's not really, um, sorry, right? Abishio is Latin for lechatchila. Um, but um, I'm asking a slightly different question, but we'll, we'll come back to Rabbi Yona tomorrow. Um, and like I said, if you finish this and want to right, definitely read the shorter pieces I gave you in the Akhona, Rabbi Kibbeger and the Avni Nizer. Um, the most expansive discussion, as I said, is from the Kabbalah de Kushyata of the Chalkad Yoav, um, which is a very funny book. Very, very funny book. Um, it's exactly what it's, right? Kaba de Kushyata literally, it's a pun. Right, a kav, a kava is a measurement, right? Like a kav, it's like a basket, a, a kav basket. A kushyata could be a type of a veg, vegetable, but this book is actually, uh, it's gematria. Kuf bet 103 de kushyata of questions. And it's just 103 random questions that he wanted to deal with. And he wrote a book of uh, just like lumdish treatises on 103 conceptual questions that he, he liked. And it's just, so it's the 103 questions. That, that's what the book is. Um, it's fascinating. But um, so uh, but we'll but start by really reading Rabbeinu Yonah, and we'll we'll st we'll try to figure out his which is you know is is more nuanced and really tries to weigh both sides. Um, so we'll we'll continue with that tomorrow, and I guess unless we really rush, that's probably what we'll end on before you guys go on your So, 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 so,